Dr. Ian Smith, welcome to the American Glutton Podcast. I got to tell you, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you, dude. There's a lot. I have. I just want to pick your brain for a while about the metabolism and all of it. But but um, I want to ask you first, simply because it's on my mind and I don't want to forget. Let's talk about metabolic flexibility. Yes, because so, I mean we have to we have to define that so that we can get into inflexibility. And I want to know what all of it means. So it's interesting. Um, I was trying to research written this is my 24th book the metflex diet okay so people say why have you written so many diet books well it's because there's no one plan that works for everybody uh, by the way that's what i love about you because sometimes you have guys who go just everybody should not eat lectins and then they die on that hill that everybody should be avoiding lectins and i like that you have 24 books because i think of any diet as a tool and like you can't build a house with just a hammer. Sometimes you need a chainsaw. Or why, you know, maybe you Jeez. don't to build a house, but you need something. What a great analogy. You're absolutely correct. And so sometimes, I, I like I wrote a plant-based book. Well, everyone doesn't want to be plant-based, but for people who are like to be plant but Anyway, I was trying to figure out why is it that so many people are, they would email me or text me and say, Dr. Ian, I'm eating correctly. I'm exercising correctly, but I can't get the scale to move. And as I'm doing this research, I come across this term called metabolic flexibility. I didn't create it, but I came across it. And metabolic flexibility is that imagine a hybrid car. A hybrid car has a battery and it has gas. And when the battery runs out, then the gas kicks in and you can still drive the car. A traditional combustion engine car that's operated by gas only has gas as a fuel source. Once the tank is empty, happening many times, the car stops, okay? Yeah. Now, take those two examples. The hybrid car is considered to be metabolically flexible. It can burn or use different fuel sources. The gas engine car is metabolically inflexible. It can only use one fuel. Well, in our bodies, Two of the biggest fuels we like to use to burn are carbs and fats. Some people can burn carbs really well and not do great with fats. Some can burn fats really well, not do well with carbs. We are metabolically inflexible. So the key with my program, the Metflex diet, is I want to take six weeks and unstick your metabolism and make you flexible so that whether you're having a carb-rich meal you can burn it, or you're having a heavy fat meal, you can burn it. That is metabolic flexibility. So it's really just to get you using those two fuels in a, in, and, and when we talk about fats, are we talking about ketones or are we just talking about without going into ketosis that we're using the fat as fuel? We're going to go into ketosis actually. So that's the okay. second part. You're jumping ahead. So, sorry. So, so no, no, it's great. So the question is, how do we become more metabolically flexible? There are four things off the top. One, this sounds boring to people, better sleep, believe it or not. Better sleep hygiene makes you more metabolically flexible. Number two, diet. You have to eat a certain type of diet. For example, cycling in and out of keto, cycling in and out is very good for improving your metabolic flexibility. I'll get into that in a second. Number three, exercise uh, is extremely helpful. And number four, intermittent fasting. So those are four things that can help unstick your metabolism and make you more flexible. The diet piece in the, the book, it's a six week program, but from the diet piece, the idea is to carb load, then go into ketosis, then come out of it in carb load and go back in ketosis. So. It's cycling in and out of ketosis, not staying there for a long period of time. I'm not a keto supporter, long-term keto for a lot of reasons, but cycling in and out of keto will give you the benefits without, in my opinion, put you at risk of some of the long-term consequences. And so, so that is the keto part. And when you're going into ketosis, you are burning your fat. You are creating, as you say, ketone bodies, which is a source of fuel, and we're burning those ketone bodies instead of burning the carbohydrates, which is actually the body's preferred fuel 
believe it or not, particularly for the brand. Yeah, there's um there's a bodybuilder uh who 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 likes to cycle fat and carb days. He his what he said to me was that you know, because we have like you can you can adapt to your diet and suddenly you're slowing down if you diet for a long time and bodybuilders are are almost always on a diet if it's in season and mm -hmm. he said that you basically trick your body your body doesn't once you when you switch from the fats to the carbs that your body doesn't know what's happening and it cannot adapt and so you will continue to lose weight that's what he said so i i guess that's similar to what you found he is absolutely correct i've been saying this for a long time that just like and by the way let me just say something the greatest wealth of information in this space, believe it or not, comes from the bodybuilding community, those muscle heads. They're professional because dieters. They are professionals and they are willing to do anything and they have thousands and thousands of people who do it. And so the muscle and fitness community, even though people people have like, they look down their nose at them, like, you know, those meat, meat heads. Let me tell you something. Those guys are human guinea pigs. I say that in a positive way in the sense of, these guys are doing this stuff and reporting it back. So he is absolutely correct. And I said this with my other book called Shred, which is that the body's overall goal is to conserve energy. Think about this for a second. The body's natural goal is to say, you know what? I want to conserve energy as best as possible. So I don't want to do anything that's going to be energy spending, running, walking, getting up and down stairs, up and down your chair. The body, if it could do it, would prefer to sit in front of a TV and just chill, right? Uber now, Eats, yeah, Postmates, that's right, that's all it. day long. That's yeah. it, all day long. Now, what happens is the minute you challenge your body, get up from a chair, go down the steps to the kitchen, uh, walk out to your car, those are challenges. The minute you challenge your body, your body says, whoop, I need energy to do these things. And so... Your body gets energy from either food you've recently eaten or from stored energy in the form of glycogen, which is a storage form of sugar. Once again, carbs are essential to your diet. Anyone who says you should not eat carbs is absolutely wrong. I don't care who it is, it's wrong. You wanna eat the right carbs, but you need carbs. Okay, now, what happens is if you are doing the same thing all the time, your body says, huh, I got this figured out. Yeah. So I know how to do this. So I'm going to use less energy to perform that function. Same thing with your diet. If you are always eating the same type of ingredients, your body says, okay, got this figured out. So I'm going to use less effort to burn that food you're eating because I know what's coming. But when you switch it and you introduce something different, your body says, whoa, 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 what is this, right? So it's in this helter, uh, skelter uh, state. And so what happens is your body now needs to get up and rambunctious. Guess what happens when you're doing all this? When you're moving around, you're burning energy. Yeah. Because your body is less efficient at performing the function, which is what you want, by the way. Think about this. This is very counterintuitive. The more inefficient your body is at doing something, the better it is for you because you're burning calories. It's requiring more work to do it. Yeah. So the bodybuilder is absolutely correct. In this program, we are going to be carb loading a little keto, carb loading a little keto because the body's being kept off kilter. And that is essential to metabolic flexibility. Yeah, I feel like, and and a lot of what you're talking about, you're talking about the the non-exercise active thermogenesis. So that is where we burn the majority of our calories. I um, spent the majority of my life morbidly obese. And, you know, exactly what you're talking about, I was constantly doing like borderline mathematical equations of how to not expend energy because standing up, I was deadlifting 300 extra pounds. Sitting down was even hard. It was a muscular workout. Getting dressed would cause me to sweat, like everything. And j just today, 
I have to talk myself out of this feeling that walking up a flight of stairs will be really hard because it's not, it's not really hard anymore, but I am my physically dead convinced that it is because my body spent so much time knowing that's really hard. Like getting to an airport late for me is tremendous, causes tremendous amounts of anxiety. And when I have to run to a gate, I get there and I'm like, that wasn't so bad. What am I freaking out about? But when I was 550 pounds, it could have been a disaster. I could have ruptured an Achilles tendon running to a gate. You know what I mean? So your body is constantly doing that. I find that every day I'm having to convince my body. This isn't as hard as I think it is. I did it yesterday. I can do it again. There's so much in there, what you just said. I mean, what I say a lot, to people when I write my programs and I and I write my programs for the average person doesn't have a lot of money may not have a gym membership stressed out about something just the average person and what I like to say to people is mentally we got to kind of refocus here yes we all want that number on the scale to go down we all want to look good in our clothes no doubt about it and there's nothing wrong with wanting to look good in your clothes but I one of the examples I tend to use, what you just said is, I say to people, what about your daily functions of living? Like, you want to be able to go from your bedroom to your kitchen without panting when you get down the steps. <laughs> you want to be able to show up. Sometimes you're late getting to a flight and you want to be able to say, no problem. I'm going to have to hustle to get to the gate. You don't have a problem doing that. What you just said is what so many people experience. And when I'm in the airport, you always will see people running to a gate for all kinds of reasons. Every time. When, every time. When I'm in the airport, I look at those people and I look at someone's body habitus and I start making some, some evaluations, right? Based on limited information. But this is probably someone who has not been physically active very, very much recently. And this person now has to run the length of the terminal in order to catch a flight. And they wouldn't do it otherwise, but they have to do this. They have to catch this flight and look at the physical disadvantage yeah. this person is in trying to get there. They are panting. Half their stuff is falling off of them. They're stopping, going, stopping, going. They're fit. You could see the anxiety. And so what I say to people is, hey, guys, let's get our bodies in a shape, in a condition. I'm not saying you have to run a marathon. That's something different. But if we need to ask our body to go up a gear, then we have need to have the confidence that it can do it. And then we gotta be able to do it. And, and that to me, and everyone has their own motivation, of course, but that to me is a great motivator to know that anytime, me personally, anytime I gotta kick it, I can kick it, right? right? I don't really wanna kick it, but if I need to go there, I can go there. And that I think is an important perspective for people who are trying to find motivation to be able to make the transformation. Yeah. I, I, I think what you're saying is so key because like th there's a lot in this area and we can talk about health and health is a great metric and, and health is important to very many people. But like when I started dieting, like when I woke up one day and, and thought I can't do I'm uh, this, is, I'm done with this. I don't care what I got to do. I'm, I, it was like step one. I put my foot onto the path and I failed many times, but I kept going failure after failure. The feeling of I can never succeed overwhelmed me many times, but I kept going and I finally found some equilibrium that I'm pretty happy with. But the reality is health was nowhere on my mind. What was on my mind was I don't want to wake up in pain. I don't want to go to sleep in pain. I don't want to have this feeling that I take up too much space in public, which makes me not want to be in public. Like it was things like that, that really got me to take that first step. I had the worst uh, blood uh, panels. Everything was bad and that all improved. And once I got to close to where I am, suddenly that became important to me too. And I started going after that, but it really wasn't a, a motivating factor at first. And I understand for some people it is right now. I, I spent uh, time 
dieting recently and and still had high and and had had low LDL and my LDL started to go up. And so I had to switch out some omega sixes for omega threes. I had to increase my fiber. And so now I am more interested in my health. But that wasn't what got me started. And that wasn't really what kept me going for a long time. So I think what you're saying is is accurate. If we can share these analogies, you know, the first time I was able to put on a seatbelt in an airplane and I didn't need an extension cord and a seatbelt extender, that was a big deal. And I felt good about that. And that was part of what made this happen for me. You know what I mean? The idea that um, I feel too tired to get up and play with my kids because my legs are sore or I'm just exhausted. I want to get rid of that. You know, it was things like that that really kept me going. So my Facebook group, before I put out any program, I take about a thousand people who follow me on Facebook. I say, guys, you want to try my new plan? Um, because I never want to put out a plan that people haven't gone through and given me feedback. It's too hard. It's we need this, blah, 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 whatever. And I listen to my guys, my people. Um, and so I put out the Metflex diet. I gave them an early access to the program. Um, thousand people, people lost uh, up to 20 pounds. Some people lost 24 pounds in six weeks, by the way. Ridiculous numbers. Average weight lost 14 pounds. But I also told them, guys, this time, let's not just focus on the scale. Let's also look at your inches, eight inches, 12 inches, 10 inches. Wonderful. But to your point, I then said, let's talk about the NSVs, the non-scale victories. What are the things that you're able to do now that you couldn't do before? Play with your kids without getting winded, right? Being able to walk, you know, the grocery store and not feel exhausted when you get to the checkout counter. These are important. The NSVs are just as important as that number and that metric on the scale. And so I encourage people who are listening now, please join my group. Uh, it's called Metflex Diet, the name of the book. But I encourage people um, that you have to think more about what you're trying to do. People just say, oh my goodness, I'm going to Jamaica. I gotta lose 10 pounds. Okay, it's okay. that's okay. But how sustainable is that perspective for six months from now or a year from now? And so what I did was, this is for the first time ever, I forgot to send you this, by the way. I wrote I wrote this little workbook and it's a workbook that's a companion to the main book. And what that workbook does is something I've always wanted to do in my writing career, which is to get people to get better insight yeah. into their own journey, not my insight, okay? I'll give you the diet and stuff and the exercise, but only you can talk about what you're feeling today, um, what your disappointments are, what actually worked for you, what's not working so well. Well, you have to organize that. You have to organize your, first of all, you have to ask yourself those questions, right? Extract those answers. Then you have to organize those answers and use that as a roadmap as you continue down, like you said, the journey, right? And so with my Metflex Diet Workbook, People every day have to wake up and come up with a word of the day. What's your word today? Hopeful, determined, whatever it is. Okay. And then I take them and it's it, my commitment to the followers is it only takes 420 seconds of your day right. to go through your daily journal. But what I learned in my group is that the people who did the workbook in conjunction with the diet, they lost 25% more weight. So I think it's so, so important. I think it's so important, you know? Yeah, and so what I, you're saying is what you talk about a lot, what you just said was you're talking about the mental side of it, right? Like you kept, you said I was determined and I kept failing, but I didn't give up. The question is, here's the goal now. Why didn't you give up? Because it, goal. because of exactly what you're talking about, because I took the, you know, I think it's one thing, and and I don't know if you have scientific data to back this up or to rationalize what I'm about to say, but there's a very big difference for me between having a conversation in my head and putting it out, taking it out of my head and having it on paper and being able to examine that and reflect on that. It's it just a different way. When it's all in my head, 
I, I almost can manipulate it in a way that doesn't serve me. But when I remove it from my head and I put it into this objectively ex external place, it's still my thought, but it's whatever meant the most that I wrote down, I can then use that to serve me in a different way. I can either take it as information to avoid something in the future or take it as information to continue doing something that was successful. And that has been pretty much the biggest place I've found change is taking what's going on within me, getting it out and being able to look at it as though it's data rather than emotion. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't care. I've written lots of diet books. The Netflix diet is great. It has great results for a lot of people. There are other great diet books, by the way, plenty of great diet programs. I don't care how good the program is. If your head is not in the game, you are not going to win. Yeah. I'm telling you. You may find some, some minor victories here and there, but you're not going to really win with. Your head has got to lead. And one of the people always say to me, well, Dr. Ian, what is something that people really mess up on? What is their biggest mistake? I always say the biggest mistake is that people ignore what's above the neck and between the ears, their mind. They don't get their mind in the game. They become more robotic, reflexive. I'm going to, here's the diet. I'm just going to follow what it says, but they're not thinking about it. They're not thinking about how it impacts them. They're not thinking about like their vision. What is your vision uh, for what you're trying to do? Right? Like you yeah. got to have vision. And so, I have found, and with my work, my Facebook groups, I think the reason why so many people in my groups lose so much weight is because they have been forced to think about it, right? And talk about it. Like you said, you got to take it out of your head because when thoughts are in your head, they are always modifiable. Yeah. They can exactly. change and you can manipulate it and it also goes away. But when you actually, Take it and write it in your phone or write it in your, your digital, your, your tablet or on paper. When you do that, the actual process of writing it has some kind of neurological effect of, of imprinting this issue or this idea. And that becomes extremely important. It becomes very foundational for you. And so that's why I think that people should spend seven minutes of a day, just seven minutes actually going through some thoughts. And once again, when you're on day 30, you then can look back on day 10. That was a really good day for you. And you say, well, why was day 10 a good day? Well, it was a good day because I was organized. I had my food ready the night before. I was being positive. Yeah. Right? So then you say, let's get back to creating more day 10s. You know, I think it's really the difference between if we go back to the the diet as a tool analogy that i and and by the way I, i'm i'm guilty of this for decades that i wanted the tool to be the solution and in that i wanted to not have to master anything because i was just relying on the tool and what i found was that you know you you, you buy a hammer you build a house the house is not going to last forever without repairs. Every single house, even if it's brand new and immaculately built, is going to need repairs. And if you don't do the repairs, the house is eventually going to fall down. And so when we're talking about our lives and most people want to lose weight as a permanent thing or a long lasting thing, you know, the idea. And I know that way, like Hollywood, there's some gals who want to just fit into a dress for a night. Right. And that's all they need to do. Fine. Do the. Hollywood cayenne pepper diet. Great. You lost, you dehydrated yourself a bit. Your skin looks like shit, but you're in the dress. Great. But like, if we're talking about people having to confront that they need to change the way they're living and they have a useful tool. And again, any diet can be a useful tool. You've written 24, 24 books on this. You've given out lots of different tools for lots of different people because we can acknowledge that there is no one size fits all thing. There's a little bit more to it in how am I going to live the rest of my life like this? Like, 
How am I going to have to use this tool every day for the rest of my life? Maybe not, but maybe in doing this, maybe in applying the application of this tool, you're going to find pieces that you will employ every day for the rest of your life. Or you're going to have to remind yourself, you know, get up in the morning, like you said, be positive. I wake up in the morning all the time and look in the mirror and think, God, I look like shit. I probably gained five pounds yesterday and I get on the scale and I didn't gain five pounds and I go, fuck, why do I look like shit? And I look back in the mirror and go, yeah, I look like shit. Okay. I know this is going to ruin my day. If I leave it like this, let's find something to be positive about. You didn't gain five pounds. What doesn't look like crap? You know what I mean? Like it's all in our heads. I think the huge portion of it is in our heads. I wrote this book as a small little book called Mind Overweight. And it's meant to be read in 120 minutes. It's a small, tiny book, but no diet at all, no exercise. It strictly talks about how to put your mind in the right place before you begin any program. I don't care whose program it is. Um, and I think that people fail diet programs so often is because simply put, they're not mentally there. Right. Um, you mentioned something that was very interesting to me. You know, I, I am a firm believer that people have to believe that they have control of their destiny. Yeah, I really believe that. If you and this but is in life, so many people don't believe that. And this is this is tough. Let's talk about this because, look, that was the biggest shift I had prior to this shift. Everything was happening to me. And it just I, one day, and and it, and it took a lot to get me there. One day, I became responsible for everything, and that was. But I think it's hard to take a person and just say you have to be in control. You know what I mean? Hundred percent. It's not easy. I'm, I'm not saying any of this stuff is easy. What I'm saying is that if you put the work in, like I tell my kids, you got to put in the work. Um, if you put the work in, um, then you start owning it, right? And you, I tell my kids all the time, listen, if you want to be good at anything in life, you got to work. And sometimes that work is not going to be fun. But then you have to learn how to embrace the process. If you can embrace the process, even with its difficulties, then you stay on top of it. And you don't allow the process to control you. You control the process. This is that control thing. Yeah. And so I think that so many, and the, the way I write my books, by the way, is I always make sure they're customizable. You know, people say, well, well, Dr. Ian, give us a grocery list. No, there is no grocery list. Because in my book, you may choose to eat eggs and I give someone else options to eat oatmeal. So how can I make a grocery list that can fit, fit everyone? Because part of what I'm trying to do in my programs, and people don't sometimes get this, is I'm not just giving you the food and exercise to lose weight. I'm actually giving you control. Right. I'm saying to you, here's a blueprint. It's not the Bible. It's not. It's just a blueprint. You decide how you want to modify this blueprint to make it work for you. And that, I think, is the elegant part of creating a program in which people have control. Because then you learn, hey, I can make this decision and that decision rather than well, Dr. Ian said, I have to eat that. <laughs> right. I can't eat that. I don't think that works in the long term. I don't either. I think I think that's why so many diets fail is because we get uh, re almost religious about this kind of thing. And, and then we have these gurus and they're in charge and they're controlling our lives. And we still don't, you know, even if we lose weight. I think what what happens is eventually we break under the pressure of having this external thing being responsible for us. Jeez, this is you can write a book just on this. This is gold. And I think that in my many years of doing this, um, I, I keep coming back to the point that people truly have and my little text messages on Facebook to my people is you have to believe. Right. You got to focus, then you got to execute. Yeah. You need all three things for it to work. Bottom line, you can believe and not execute, ain't going to work. Right. You can focus, but not believe it's going to work. You're going to psych yourself out, ain't going to work. Right. You, yeah. 
you, you got to have those three ingredients to your recipe. You can add some other stuff, by the way, if you want to, right? But those are the three essential ingredients to anybody's plan, for whose it is. If it's a crazy, wacky diet, you still have to have those elements because if you don't have those elements, you're not going to follow the plan. It's not going to work. Either. Yeah. And and a lot of those crazy, wacky diets work. I guess, uh, you know, you, you said you didn't like keto long term. I don't like keto for the other reason, which is it's this. It was sold to me as like you can eat whatever you want. You'll lose all the weight you need and you never have to. And exactly what your diet handles, the the flexible, the uh, the metabolic flexibility handles is that if you do anything, your body figures it out eventually. And so if you have 200, I had close to 300 pounds to lose. And so if I just do the same thing for years, eventually my body goes, bitch, I figured you out. I'm not doing it anymore. You're not, you're no longer losing weight. And so su suddenly I'm like, well, I guess I'm eating too much. And now I'm counting calories on keto, which I'm like, I thought we didn't have to do this. This was the whole point. Um, and I think that a lot of people run into that. Not to mention, I also had very high cholesterol while doing keto and some other metabolic issues that were not ideal. Um, but like, you know, I think what you're talking about is the solution to that. Like, you know, and, and I think, you know, the other thing I had the problem with is a lot of people, and I say this almost purely anecdotally, I misinterpreted um, high fat foods with high carb foods. Like I looked at pizza and thought of it as a carb food. And I think there's more energy by volume delivered through fat on a pizza or a donut or a cheeseburger you know what I mean? I just thought, well, yes. it's got a bun. That's a carb. Um, so there's that kind of, you know, you go into it with a, a misunderstanding and, you know, I had the belief, I had the execution, but it long term was not the right plan for me. People have to understand that the body requires macronutrients. The reason why we call them macronutrients is simply because the body needs them in macro supply, large supply. Right. So anyone who says, don't eat fat, don't eat carbs. No, no, no. The body needs them, right? All three elements. Now, the body doesn't need, you know, 80% of its calories coming from fats or carbs or even protein. You need a mixture, right? A proper uh, distribution of these macronutrients. And so, and once again, this is where the bodybuilders do all this stuff, the macros, the macros, right? Yeah. But macros are important without getting overly scientific. The macro cocktail is important based on what you're trying to do, right? If you're trying to gain more muscle and hypertrophy and those kind of things, we're going to change your macro composition. You're going to be eating a lot more protein, okay? Um, if we're trying to cut, um, you know, we're probably going to eat some more carbs. Um, if we're trying to bulk, we're going to end up probably eating fattier foods. So our fat content is going to go up. So I think that people just have to have, and what I try to do in the Netflix diet in the first couple of chapters is give people just kind of an understanding of how this whole thing works. Listen, this stuff is complicated science and I'm trying to distill it into a couple of chapters. I don't want you to have to get a PhD to read a right. book. That's my job, right? But what I do want you to do though is at least have a basic understanding of what the rules are of the game and where the standings are in the rest of the league, who stands where. You got to have context. You don't walk into a, a I, I do a lot of sports analogies. I'm a sportsman. You don't walk into a game not knowing who your opponent is, whether or not they, how they like to play offense and defense. You got to have some awareness of that. Same thing with dieting and eating well is that you have to have some context. This is the plan I'm going to do. These are the principles of the plan. And then when you're doing it, you are more in tune and engaged and informed rather than just doing it because Dr. Ian said, hey, choose one of these two items and eat it at 10 o'clock in the morning. Right. I mean, that's the that's the whole that's kind of the whole game. Right. The blueprint idea solves a lot because, you know, you do Weight Watchers, you have points. How long are you counting points? Are you counting points the rest of your life? You, you know what I mean? Like. 
I I couldn't do it. I broke after a while. I just nah, was like, not I'm me. Not, I'm not, not for counting me. points anymore. And um, or counting calories. I don't want you counting calories either. Right. Like you talk about taking the fun out of something to sit down and have to whip out your phone and look up calorie counts. No, the way I write my programs is that I do all that stuff for you. But what I want you to learn is portion control. Right. Like don't sit down to a 16 ounce steak. A six ounce steak will work and then have some other stuff with it. Right. And so that's really because Food is fun. It's enjoyable in many ways. I don't want to take the fun out of food, but I don't want the fun to kill you either. And so yeah. I think that I'm trying to teach people how to make the better decision 70% of the time, not all the time. No one's perfect. I'm not perfect. I go to the Bulls games, Chicago Bulls games, and I'm on Instagram and I'm showing you I'm eating a slice of rainbow cake. Well, guess what? I eat about a third of it, but I'm good. Right. I mean, I, they serve huge chunks, unfortunately, but I eat a third. I'm done. I get one pretzel. I love eating pretzels since I was a little kid. I buy one of those soft pretzels. I'm done. I'm not going to eat three pretzels. You don't see me with the cheese, with the 400 calories. So my thing is, to your point, I'm not asking you to count points or calories. I'm asking you to have an understanding and a better relationship to what makes sense. Sitting down to this 36 ounce tomahawk is nonsensical at right. one sitting. Eat some of it, take it to go. You can think about this you could take that one thing and eat for three days. You can chop it up over a salad, right? Would be great. You can make a, a, a sandwich, would be, you know, they're all kind of. I just want people to be able to eat and enjoy it without feeling the stress of as you say point counting or even calorie counting. Yeah, and I I think your 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 workbook will be super beneficial to people because you know, I I didn't even think about this for the longest time, but like there's you go into Best Buy to to replace your SIM card or something, you're buying a computer or whatever you go, people a TV. They're selling you food at the exit. You go into Office Depot to buy a ream of paper. They're selling you food at the exit. You stop to buy Home a Depot. Like, Home Depot, every point of commerce we went, and I've said this before, and people are probably so sick of hearing it, but we went to a furniture store and it was like super fancy and it made me uncomfortable because I don't feel comfortable in fancy places, but my wife likes it. And <laughs> we're in this furniture store and I pulled her aside at one point and I said, you know what the best thing about this is? Nobody's, there's no food. They're not selling us any food. You know, it's fancy. And she said, no, no, they offered me champagne and chocolate dipped strawberries. So like even there, they're offering food and it's inescapable. What do you do in your day? You drive to work. I bet there's a kitchen at your work where there's food. You go, you got to stop for gas. There's a ton of food at the gas station. The grocery store obviously is all food, but they're saving like super high caloric snacks for right at the checkout in case you're hungry from shopping. You know what I mean? Like you can just pop this Twix in your mouth and you got a soda we are in a point in where where there's so much food around us all the time. It really took me looking at that in a way where I was writing it down one day of like, you know, every time I go to Best Buy, it was Best Buy, I eat something. What's happening there? And and I I it was doing it on automatic. I wasn't thinking about it. It was just happening. And then I'd like kind of wake up in my car having eaten something and go like, what, what happened? Where was I? I'm on a diet. How did that happen? And I had to write it down to turn off that automaticity, to turn off that, that rote existence that I was playing because it was just my structure. My function as a person was you, you get a snack when you go do something hard, like walk around a store. And let me tell you something. Mine was every time I checked out a home Depot, I had to buy a Reese's cup yeah. every single time. And I was like, hold on for a second. It was almost, honestly, it got to the point where I felt like I was excited to go to Home Depot, not because I needed to buy the stuff, right. but because I knew that was my allowance to get that Reese's, right? Yeah. And so I stopped. I just said, I mean, I will have it occasionally, not there. I, I won't buy anything there because I feel like 
that was a bad pattern. Yeah. Okay. If I want, I'm at the airport, maybe I'm waiting for a flight. I may pop one, but I'm okay with that. But people have to understand their bad patterns and try to deconstruct them and form better patterns. And that's part of, I think, the journey. I mean, you listen, I've never had to lose weight before. You've had to lose weight. So you have so much more kind of um, information, experiential, empirical data that I don't have. Um, and so you know better than anyone kind of all of these triggers and these um, these pitfalls uh, that can, you know, be in your way on this journey. But listen, it is a journey. It's a, it's a non-ending journey, by the way. And I don't say that in a way like it's going to be labor. And I say that in the sense of your weight's going to fluctuate. You're going to have bad days, good days, bad weeks, good weeks. That's just life. Like no one... People see me like, Dr. Ian, you're always so fit, like, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know what? I'm always in great shape, but not because I'm perfect. It's because, you know what? I try to make sure that on average that I'm doing good, right? On average. That means that there's going to be some bad days for me and some bad weeks. You know, I I said to myself on Instagram uh, about eight weeks ago, I posted a friend of mine sent me a shop of the two of us in Brazil, and we had just finished playing tennis, I had my shirt off. I was jacked and I was ripped. And I was like, gee, and it was it was like 20 years ago, maybe. I was like, man, that looks good, right? right. Now, yeah. I'm not really I'm not really far, far, far away from that, but I'm not there. I said to myself, you know what? I'm gonna post this picture on Instagram and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be back here in six weeks. That was my tool to say. This is my motivator. And I'm putting it out in the public to make myself accountable. Last six weeks, I've been going real hard. And I look great. And it, it's people are seeing me. Like today, someone said to me, wow, you look different. You look really like, yes. But I think it's a journey for me too. Like I'm not always at my best, right? But the key is you want your worst to still be decent. Yeah. Right? You yeah. want your... You, you, you want your worst day to still be an okay day. When you can do that, like playing golf, when when a bad round of golf is still in the high 80s, low 90s, that's pretty darn good. Yeah, the thing that's, you said that that resonates the most with me is that it's it's for life. and and I think that for the longest time, I really did conceive of, a diet as a solution and a diet's always short term. A diet is, you know, when we think about restrictive food, like the, if, if you restrict food forever, you die, like you eventually die. That's, that's like a diet has to, by nature, be a short term thing. And if that's the solution and we just go back to whatever our life habits were prior to the diet, what was the point? We could have just skipped the trouble and kept doing what we were doing. But when when I started to think about it, I'm a sober person and it was very helpful to be a sober person. And I didn't even being a sober person. It took me like 15 years of dieting to go, oh, my God, they're so similar. I'm not you know, there's no there's no two months in rehab and then you're solved. Sobriety <laughs> for me is the rest of my life. And even if some days are worse than others, I'm working at sobriety every day. But I wasn't thinking about dieting this way. Dieting was, I'll do this for 30 days. I'll do this for two months. I'll do this even for three months. And it's going to be miserable, but I'm going to be great when it's done with no thought of what I was going to do after. And when I think about it now as a lifelong pursuit, when there is no sp sprinting for the finish line. And to your point too, like I've been more shredded than I am now. Somebody says to me, like, I want to take a picture of you with your shirt off. I'm like, great, let's talk in a month or six weeks. You know what I mean? That's not <laughs> happening today um, because I, I, I don't like to live that way. That's really difficult to get to. And it takes work, but I found this equilibrium. The equilibrium is 15% body fat. I'm cool. I can live like this forever. It still takes work. It's not autopilot. Right. Right. Well, 
you hit it. And I think that I think that a lot of people out there who are who have struggled, who are struggling, or who will struggle, I think that would benefit them to think in in those terms, to think that there is no perfect. Um, and if you were to reach perfect, perfect is not sustainable. It just isn't. Like where, where, what, what is the point that you're just going to be okay and happy with? Right. What's the point? And it may be five pounds overweight, maybe six or seven. That may be your happy place. And that's okay. And then if you want to go down a little bit, you can sometimes. But I think that people just have to be more realistic and have that better insight to it. Um, and I think it becomes transformative if they have it. I do too. It's 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 a it's a very interesting thing to conceptually talk about having had that almost moment of clarity. You know, it was like a moment of clarity for me to get off drugs and alcohol. And then it was and it took way too long, in my opinion, for me to have this moment of clarity about how I was doing this cycling diets and fighting for my life, um, working way harder than I needed to work and doing stuff that was totally not sustainable. And the moment of clarity was like, oh my God, the slow and steady wins the race. I'm gonna get there and I'm gonna be happy and it's not gonna be as hard. I'm not gonna be lightheaded every time I stand up. I'm not gonna be shivering you know, when it's relatively warm inside because my whole system has shut down. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like, but it's gonna take a while and that's okay too. And. I'm going to have to do a lot of work to, you know, there was a point in time where I changed how I drove home just because I wanted to avoid the pattern of the fast food drive throughs that yeah. I was so accustomed to driving into. And, yeah. and I don't have to avoid streets now, but I did for a while and that was okay to do too until I felt comfortable, you know, like I wasn't going to, uh, go into a blackout and wind up right. like with a face full of McDonald's. You know what I mean? Like that was happening to me. Right. right. Yeah. I, I think that I've, I've mentioned this before, by the way, that people, one of the things is we talk about triggers that people should understand what triggers them. And sometimes you actually have to physically make adjustments to avoid those triggers until you kind of work it out. Um, but I also think that um, people have to also be realistic Um I think a lot of people are unrealistic about weight loss. Um, my diets have produced a tremendous amount of weight in short periods of time, but that's not going to happen for everybody. You know, good weight loss is really good. Weight loss is an average of one to two pounds a week. Right. That's really good weight loss. And people want to lose five pounds every week. You know, one lady in my program lost eight pounds the first week. Wow. And so every week she wanted to lose eight pounds. No, it doesn't work that way. Like, no. And so I think that people have to be realistic about the programs that they're about to try, but they also have to be realistic about the results Yeah, and their expectations need to be appropriate to what are realistic results. And I think that that's, that's extremely important. Well, I think it's important too, that we have guys like you who are very smart in this area. You've, you've delivered a lot of knowledge to a lot of people. And even you, you're saying like, Here's a picture of me from years ago. I'm going to now get back there because this is not how I live every day. I need to do work to get back there. You know, um, the the day I had a full visible, visible six pack and I had uh, vascularity in my abdomen, I even with all of the reading and mental work, I got there and I went, OK, now it's this forever. And it was just it was just not in the cards, dude. You know what I mean? Like, hard, man. It was so hard. And, and that was when I had to come to terms with like, am I really willing to basically be hungry all the time? No, I was not willing to do that. It's a great realization. And um, I'm hoping that people with my new program, the Metflex diet will understand that number one, give yourself grace. Don't be so hard on yourself, number one. People are too hard on themselves when it comes to weight loss. Life is bigger than everything. Everything. Life is bigger than everything. But I'm hoping that people will realize that there are different reasons why we're not able to lose weight effectively. And it may not be because you're a bad person or you're doing something bad or wrong. It's because maybe your metabolism is just stuck. Um, and some people, that's not the case, but the reason why... I've entered this installment 
of a program is because this really addresses your metabolism and other kind of metabolic problems that people have, something called metabolic syndrome, which is a constellation of, of, of risk factors that put you at risk for heart disease, uh, for stroke, for diabetes. Uh, and so I'm hoping that with this six week program that the average person, just like those in my Facebook group, will really come to own it and come to um, not just see results, but now have a different perspective of what they can do and also realize that you don't have to be on a diet forever. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really important. I can't wait to check this out because I think it will give, you know, when I would, when I would talk to this bodybuilder and he, he's really a trainer of bodybuilders and he's also ripped as hell, but, and he talked about the, you, you know, the body not being able to figure out what you're doing. I can't wait to read your book, to read the data, to go like, oh, this is what he was saying in a sentence. You know what I mean? And here's, here's how this is working. Um, uh, because like, I got to be honest with you. I, I eat like mostly low fat. And I wind up sometimes having dreams about a ribeye steak and going like, I should just have a fat day. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I do on Sundays when I don't work out, that's generally the day that my carbs go down and my fats go up, but I will be more than happy to have two or three days like that. You know? Well, I used to eat a lot of ribeyes, by the way, my favorite steak, um, a lot. And I've drastically cut my red meat consumption because I knew that eating that much red meat was not good, even though I love the taste of it and still love the taste of it, but it just wasn't good. And I thought I would have withdrawal from giving up ribeyes and steak. I surprisingly did not. Yeah. Um, and I was just saying this something today. I forget the last time I had a steak. Right. I used to have steak twice a week, at least, by the way. At least I don't remember the last time I actually had a steak. Um, but I will eat one if if for some reason I have this great impetus, hey, get a ribeye. I don't have a problem doing that because. I'm only going to take six ounces. I tell my butcher, cut them real thin. I like thin steaks and I'll do it. Boom. It's over. I just, but I haven't had that yearning for it. Right. And I think that people have to understand that when you make lifestyle modification, that it becomes who you are. And um, it's a wonderful place to be because you no longer are controlled by what you thought would be necessities in your life, you know, and you're yeah. able to turn what I say, you're able to turn the corner. Yeah. I'm excited about your book, Dr. Ian. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Uh, you're such a wonderful guy. I really appreciate this conversation. Well, I, I appreciate you, by the way, and your experience. I always admire people like you, by the way, who've had to lose weight. I have never had to do that, but I admire you guys because you guys found something clicked and you found it which is what I'm always trying to write about. You found what it took for you to say, this is this is what I need to do and this is my commitment. So I want to encourage once again, before I go, um, join my group. I do two zone, two free Zoom coaching sessions a week because I like to just help people. Uh, it's called Met Flex Diet, the name of the book. And my Instagram is at Dr. Ian Smith, spell the doctor out, I-A-N Smith. Yeah, I, by the way, your your Facebook group sounds awesome. I, you know, like there's nothing like being a guinea pig on a diet because I'll try any diet. I've done them all. And I think they're very useful tools. You know, I would love I would love your feedback down the road about Netflix. I really think since you've had such a broad experience, I really would love to hear what you how you feel about it. I think you're really going to like it. Well, it I think it it is a, a more pronounced version of the way I live my life because I do tend to have carbier days when I work out and then days I don't work out fats go up carbs go down but there's no reason because I've done I've done keto before there's no reason I couldn't be in ketosis a day or two out of the week you know what I mean and I think that would be an interesting experiment yeah all right I'll look back forward to hearing back from you then all right man thank you all right man nice talking to you you too bye all right